I'm Hallie, and right now we are coming on the air with some breaking news, gearing up to see the world's biggest, most powerful rocket take off in literally, we think, the next five minutes in Texas. The window opens at 5 p.m. Eastern. That is four minutes and 50 seconds away. This is a really interesting, potentially historic moment, one that mixes space with politics. This thing is a SpaceX event, of course, so obviously Tesla CEO Elon Musk is there. But you see who else is there? President-elect Trump, who's chosen Musk to lead this, remember, Department of Governmental Efficiency, if you will. Texas Senator Ted Cruz is behind them, too. That's on the right. On the left is the live shot. Listen, it's a little bit messy. It's live TV. We're going to see live coverage of this thing, where it is just about 4 o'clock down there in Boca Chica, Texas. When this massive, super heavy starship takes off, it's like 90 feet bigger than the Statue of Liberty. It's going to get ready for its final test flight in just the next couple of minutes. Let me walk you through what you're about to see. This two-part mega rocket will launch into space. The Starship itself and the booster will then separate. And then, and this is what you're going to want to watch for, the booster will make its way back into these metal, like, chopstick-looking things. It's this launch tower. That's a huge part of this test, right? This is part of Elon Musk's big push to create a heavy rocket that is totally reusable that he hopes could someday take humans to the moon and maybe even Mars. Now, you saw the arrival here. There's Musk and President-elect Trump wearing, of course, that signature red hat. One big question, could their closeness, right, could this relationship that the two have built over the course of the last 8 to 12 months, could it speed up the process? We've got team coverage tonight. Vaughn Hilliard is standing by in West Palm Beach. But I want to start with my friend and colleague, Gotti Schwartz, uh, our senior, like, space excitement correspondent here who's watching this with us. So, Gotti, this is super interesting. There's some potential firsts that could happen here. It's the sixth test launch for this rocket, and the big moment is going to see, can it land back into those pincers, those chopstick-looking things? Yeah, that's right. It is a new frontier, so who knows what's going to happen. Best case scenario, uh, like you said, we're going to see round two of quite possibly one of the greatest engineering feats in the modern era. We'll see the most powerful rocket ever built by humanity. That super heavy takeoff with the massive starship mounted on top. Remember, this isn't one thing. This is two uh, different pieces of spacecraft, really. It's going to blast off from Texas. Then about two and a half minutes in, if everything goes according to plan, the hot staging starts, which is when Starship and Super Heavy separate high above the Earth. That's when things get super interesting. That massive rocket does this, uh, like, wild flip. It comes back screaming down to Earth. That's when you hear the sonic boom, like this upside-down candle. And if they can get everything right, it lands, it vectors itself into the perfect position in between those chopstick-looking arms at the launch site. Uh, site. We know that as... Uh, Mechazilla, and then it comes to a rest, ready uh, eventually to be loaded up with fuel again. The cadence in the future which in which they want to launch these rockets is, is pretty remarkable. Um, and that's something that we all saw in astonishment as it stuck the landing during its first attempt just a little while back. Uh, meanwhile, high up, again, that's just part one of it, high up. Uh, part two is happening up in space. Starship cruises for a little bit. That's the top uh, of this massive contraption. Then it comes in hot, belly flopping through the atmosphere with some new and improved heat shields. We're going to see this, this incredible uh, plasma uh, that surrounds those heat shields. Uh, and then as it comes into the atmosphere, it pencils up. And it does this controlled burn, splash down, hopefully, into the Indian Ocean, showing that it also has the ability to right itself and then control uh, its descent. If it hadn't already been pulled off once before, people would be betting hard that this was a, a, a long shot, like they were the last time. But again, SpaceX has pulled this off before, so hopefully this is going to be the kind of fine-tuning needed to make the whole system truly reusable and eventually be the backbone of, of the Artemis 40. 3 dream of getting us back up to the moon and beyond. Worst-case scenario, as they say at SpaceX, rapid unscheduled and assembly, right which means that. that it could just, like, blow up. So we're, we're going to see, Gotti, we're like T-minus 30 seconds. We're going to take a minute. We're just going to listen in for, for a minute here to, to see this launch. Let's listen to the mission control. All right, we're now T-minus 20 seconds until liftoff of Starship Flight 6. This will mark our second attempt to catch the super heavy booster at the launch tower, as well as...
vehicle is pitching down range. Booster Raptor, she more pressure nominal. Booster and ship, avionics power and telemetry nominal. We're just a little over a minute maximum into the flight. Dynamic pressure. We're about six miles away, so all the sound's still hitting us here. Hearing good call outs that power telemetry nominal that's flying straight and true. We do see all 33 Raptor engines lit up on telemetry screens. At this point, we've passed through that point of maximum aerodynamic pressure, that max Q. Now, coming up in just a little over a minute from now is going to be hot staging. So we're going to see the six engines on the ship ignite while still attached to the booster. Just before that, we'll see all but three center engines on the booster shut down. And what we call Miko, it's most engines cut off instead of main engine. Gotti Schwartz is with us still. And Gotti, so all right, we, we saw the launch. The rocket has taken <laughs> off. You heard mission control layout, what yes. is going to happen here. We're waiting to see oh these, these pieces essentially separate before, before in about six minutes or so, maybe five and a half minutes, the landing back into that sort of chopstick pincer we've been talking about, Gotti. I, I can't tell you how wonderful it sounds to hear the word nominal. Nominal. Mm. Everything is going okay. You see all those Raptor engines. In the past, we've seen uh, sometimes it hasn't been so clean. That that white glow underneath uh, Starship and underneath the super heavy there. Uh, maybe not all the Raptor engines and were firing, we heard, but that is a perfect picture right there. We are waiting for that hot catch. stage. We, uh, we are waiting for the uh, the separation, and should be happening in just a moment here. Oh. Oh, there it goes. That's it. That's hot staging. Okay. And and now it now we see the flip. Uh, we see the flip. We see super heavy coming back down to earth. Oh my gosh. Go for catch. Okay, so I got a booster coming home real soon. Oh man. Sorry, and then and then hey Hallie, That's you right. see Take that? Take it be. We can make, we can like listen for a sec here, Gotti, because okay. I think folks know so right? it's going to flip, it's going to turn around and come back and land essentially, yep. right? But but there is one thing in that shot again. And if that shot comes in, I want you to pay very close attention. It's not just the fin that's doing a lot of like the maneuvering or helping with the maneuvering. There's this little stubby thing uh, that you would never expect is like something that is capable of helping hold up this entire structure. But if that stubby thing happens, uh, stubby Everything pops up on, on the screen again. I'm going to point it out because that, that needs to hit the landing spot perfectly, and it is extremely small. There we go. 30 seconds left. Oh, there it is. See that little stub right there next yep. to the fin? That is what they are going to put into a spot on those chopsticks. So it's not just catching this thing with chopsticks. It is lining up that little stubbin exactly onto the arms so that it latches into that superstructure. Former NASA astronaut Mike Massimino is with us as well. And Mike, put that into sort of plain English terms, how difficult that feat may be. Yeah, it's just pretty incredible, Hallie. Um, you, you, we haven't been able to do it before until the last flight that SpaceX conducted with such a huge vehicle, such a large launch vehicle, to come back precisely and get caught in midair is, is amazing because it's gone a quite a long distance. It's huge. It's like a skyscraper. And it comes back with pinpoint accuracy, just the right amount of fuel. Everything works so you can grab it. So I, I, don't, I don't know how they do it, but there's a lot of smart people figuring that out for sure. Explain why this could be so critical for the future of space travel, because obviously this is a test at the moment today, mm -hmm. what we're Watching, but soon it could end up as part of a real plan to try to get people to the moon in two years from now, maybe then on to Mars. Talk through what that would look like. Yeah, you know, everyone's interested or wants to see again the, the big rocket get caught in with those mechanical arms. That's pretty cool. 
But I'm also very interested to see what happens with the Starship, the ship itself. It's going to be doing some different things on reentry. It's going to come in over the Indian Ocean as it has before. But this time it's going to restart one of the Raptor engines, just like it would on a descent coming into a planetary surface, whether that means a return to Earth or a landing on Mars or the Moon. It's also going to detect the tiles, the thermal protection system, and its ability to maneuver. So uh, a lot of this is about landing, and eventually what we what we're what they're hoping to do is Mike, land on. people on the moon. I don't want to. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mike, but SpaceX is apparently saying maybe this catch could not happen. Let me listen in here. Mm -hmm. In any of those areas, exactly, and we're still going to get a lot of good flight data with booster even, but especially with ship. Again, we have an additional objective today to do an in-space relight of a Raptor engine, which again will help us set us up for uh, being able to do deorbit burns, which is- Ship chamber pressure is phenomenal. Which, which is important for orbital flights. And what you're seeing on your screen is a view from Super Heavy as it's making its way back down to Earth. Yeah, once again, we are attempting an offshore landing of the Super Heavy booster. Uh, so we have seen this before, uh, and it is still very fun to watch, <laughs> watching it come down uh, for a soft splashdown uh, off the Gulf Coast of Texas. We can see it there re-entering. Uh, we saw earlier those grid fins. There are four hypersonic grid fins. Or we can see that the landing burn has begun on the Super Heavy booster. Let me explain to folks what you're seeing here. This is the relight there. Mike Massimino, let me bring you back in because this, what's happening now, what we're watching, this is not what SpaceX wanted to see. Well, no, they were hoping to do a repeat of what they did uh, last month where they were able, actually able to catch the booster with those mechanical arms. That's not happening, but you still saw a, a lighting of the rocket and kind of a simulated uh, entry, um, simulated to the launch pad, although they used the ocean. So still, I think they might say they successfully came back and tested the engines and so on and got a lot of good data. But no, I think their, their primary objective was to do a repeat with the heavy, the, uh, the heavy launch vehicle there to return it to the launch pad. That didn't happen today. Part of the reason why they wanted to catch it in those pincers, right, in those metal pincers, mm -hmm. it, it didn't happen. You saw the, the s s Starship land in the ocean there. Um, it's because they wanted to reuse it. So what happens yeah. to it now? Do they go, I assume, recover it? I, I'm not sure what happens. I think it might be, that might be a one-time use for that one. Uh, I'm not sure, but that's you, typically what happens when, we, when you land a vehicle like that in the ocean. But I'm not, I'm not really sure. I don't know. I don't know if they have a way to recover it. The, the space shuttle had solid rocket boosters that would land in the ocean and could be recovered. I'm not sure about this one. This is awfully large to be able to be recovered in the ocean, but I don't know. Maybe they have a plan to do that. Well, we've been calling it super heavy for a reason. So again, just to recap for folks, over the course of the last eight and a half minutes, we have watched the Starship launch off that rocket booster separate, but it did not land back in the area that SpaceX had hoped that it would, back in those uh, metal pincers, essentially, those kind of chopsticks. They were hoping to do that. They were testing this. This was a test launch, of course, try to catch it back to reuse the Starship. Instead, the Starship has splashed down uh, in the ocean. Uh, that is uh, not the outcome they had hoped for, although you're hearing some of the engineers talk about the gathering of flight data. They were able to relight one of the engines back on re-entry into orbit. Gotti Schwartz, I'll go to you, because, friend, I know you were looking forward to potentially seeing the catch. Yeah, and, and if, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken here, I believe the default right now, as they're still testing all this out, is actually uh, to have a landing kind of like what we're seeing right now. It, it is a manual go that the flight director over at SpaceX has to enter for the catch to happen in the Mechazilla arms, if you will. Uh, let me just read this to you. Um, this, is, this is straight from SpaceX, but they, they're basically saying if that command is not sent prior to the completion of the boost back burn, which is what we saw, or there are automated health checks that show unacceptable conditions with Super Heavy or the tower, which is clearly what we saw, either something was going wrong with the tower or Super Heavy, then the booster will default to a trajectory that takes it uh, to a landing burn and a stop, soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. So they're saying they expect, accept no compromises when it comes to ensuring the safety of the public or their team, and, and the return into those arms will only happen if the conditions are exactly right. Clearly, uh, something was not nominal, either with the uh, super heavy or with the, the super
infrastructure launch uh, site. And so that manual, um, uh, that, that manual directive was not entered, and they defaulted into this landing in the ocean. But again, this is just part one of the show. Uh, second part still happening uh, high above us, uh, actually high above the Indian Ocean in, in a few moments here, which is that starship uh, cruising above the Earth. And again, if everything goes according to plan, uh, like uh, and Mike that's what you're seeing on the about, left there, Gotti. Yeah, they, they are going to be doing uh, some different types of experiments that we've seen in the past. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the angle of, of attack is going to be a lot more dramatic than it was in the past. Yeah. Um, if if we are lucky, we're going to see this incredible like plasma enveloping the the heat shield, which is something that humans, unless you're an astronaut looking out the peephole <laughs> upon reentry, uh, get to see. So that's always very very exciting. And then we will see uh, the splashdown in the Indian Ocean. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, that's that's the plan. And and you're right. This is uh, this is a really interesting test. You know, there's one thing for the heavy lift vehicle. But for that starship, the ship part, I am actually more interested to see how that works because this is the plan. The plan is to take that starship to the moon and land people on the moon with that starship. So they're collecting a lot of data of what it would be like for an entry, the, the heat shield, the different positions that you said, the maneuvering, the angle of attack. So I'm pretty excited about this part that's coming up. And what's the timing on that, Mike? When we're going to see more information start to come back in? Well, they said the entire uh, the entire flight was going to take about an hour or so. So I think they lifted off right about on time, around five or so. If, from what they had said earlier, I think we should expect that at about six or so local Eastern time. Um, but maybe there's an update on that. I know what you both will be doing at 6 Eastern time uh, as we watch that booster, of course, slash back down in the ocean. We're watching Starship. Vaughn, let me go to you because we've had you standing by. We've shown a couple of shots of some of the folks who are watching this launch. One of the people, of course, is President-elect Donald Trump. He's become very close with SpaceX founder and head Elon Musk, as you're looking at some of the video here from moments ago. Uh, a dynamic that is playing out in a very public way. As you see Musk there, this is live, by the way, speaking with Donald Trump Jr., President-elect Trump. You see Senator Ted Cruz, a couple of others as well, uh, other senators too, Vaughn. Talk us through some of the dynamics here, especially with the potential for a conflict of interest once President-elect Trump does take office because of some of the regulations that SpaceX is involved with, with the federal government. Right. Undoubtedly, this was a welcome break for the president-elect to leave his Mar-a-Lago estate where he's been working through transition planning and selections here. And Elon Musk, let's be very clear, he's not just playing the role of a friend or and Donald Trump is not just an interested observer on this launch that took place in Texas today, but instead Elon Musk has become arguably his top informal advisor mm -hmm. over the course of the last two weeks on this transition. We have heard from multiple sources who have described Elon Musk to us as a near constant presence at Mar-a-Lago who is engaged in the uh, considerations for these top positions from defense secretary to attorney general selection to health and human services pick of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Elon Musk has been there at Mar-a-Lago by his side. But you mentioned the concern potentially of Elon Musk's relationship, the, the richest man in the world who is now befriended and become this informal advisor to the incoming president of the United States in a considerable way. And that is around the potential conflicts of interest. Of course, he, Elon Musk and his companies from Tesla to uh, SpaceX have more than $19 billion, $19 billion in federal government contracts. And there is some concern, especially with Donald Trump, just last week suggesting that he was going to put Elon Musk along with uh, political ally Vivek Ramaswamy in charge of uh, serving as an outside advisor on how to make the government more efficient and where they could find budget cuts. Exactly whether Elon Musk will uh, you know, adhere to the conflicts of interest and financial disclosures that usually individuals who either work in the government or consult for the government have to adhere to. Of course, if you're looking at SpaceX, they're not the only ones in the industry. You have the likes of Boeing. And Elon Musk has been openly critical in recent weeks and 
in months about several of the government agencies, including the FAA, who has sought to fine his companies for not adhering to uh, some specific safety regulations. He has criticized the FAA for a delay in Starlink's approval, which is the key internet provider, suggesting that it could have saved lives in North Carolina. So Donald Trump is turning to somebody in real time who has a big financial stake in federal government contracts for projects like SpaceX, but also has an, tapped this very individual to potentially make suggestions that could impact the likes of NASA, which often does turn through yeah. a competitive bidding processes through other companies that are not Elon Musk's own. Von Hilliard, thank you very much for that. Uh, Mike Massimino, Gotti Schwartz, thank you both. We're going to keep an eye, of course, on what else is happening with SpaceX. We'll come back to you, I know, at the top of the next hour. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Also, in just the last few hours, as we saw President-elect Trump down there in Texas, he's also making a few more selections for people who he wants to help lead his administration come next year, including, yeah, that's somebody on the left you probably have heard of, Dr. Oz, for head of Medicare and Medicaid services. And he's tapping his transition co-chair and Cantor Fitzgerald CEO Howard Lutnick to lead his Department of Commerce. This is the latest in what's been a pretty quick push. It's gone forward at a pretty rapid pace to fill out his senior top-level staff and, and department heads. He's named 29 people already compared to the three he'd announced by this point back in 2016. But it's one of those selections, one of those picks, the one for AG, Matt Gates, who continues to get a lot of attention ahead of tomorrow's House Committee discussion on an investigation into the sexual misconduct and illicit drug use allegations against Mr. Gates, allegations he denies. In just the last few hours, we're learning of a fourth witness who testified she saw Gates at sex parties in 2017. That's after my sit down, my interview with that lawyer for a woman who told the committee she was paid to have sex with Gates at a 2017 party when she was 19, and that she also saw her 17-year-old friend having sex with Gates that same night. Her attorney says that his client testified that she believed Mr. Gates was not aware that her friend was underage. We're also just learning tonight these same women had their sealed testimony to the House Committee hacked, right? Those documents were gotten into. They shouldn't have been downloaded from a secure link. They haven't been released. It happened overnight. A source familiar telling NBC News the information in those documents is detailed and damaging. Again, Gates has denied all allegations of wrongdoing against him. And today you had President-elect Trump taking an all-hands-on-deck approach to try to get Gates through a Senate confirmation. He's working the phones directly with senators to get them on board. He's sending over VP-elect J.D. Vance here to the Hill for FaceTime with hesitant members. And he's considering even the possibility of recess appointments, we'll explain what that is, to put his cabinet picks in place without the traditional full confirmation process in the Senate. NBC's Ryan Nobles is juggling plenty for us tonight. And let's start with the gates of it all, if we will. We're looking ahead to this House Ethics Committee meeting tomorrow to discuss releasing this report on Gates. Democrats, some Republicans want this out there. Will we know tomorrow and will we see it? I think that's an open question, Hallie. I, the Democrats on the panel have made it clear that they think the report should be released. There are Senate Republicans that definitely want to see what is in that report or at least the evidence that contributed to that report. But it's the House Republicans that are a live ball here. Uh, we know that the House Speaker, Mike Johnson, has specifically said that he doesn't want to see this report released. We know the chairman of the committee, Michael Guest, actually had a conversation with the speaker where the speaker made it clear to him what his position was. But Guest also said that the speaker was going to allow the members of this panel to make the decision on their own. Uh, this is going to be a closed door meeting. They may not emerge from this meeting and tell us what they've decided. Uh, they may okay. decide to just hand the information over to the Senate without making it public to the rest of us. Uh, but tomorrow is no doubt a very important day, a very important step in this process uh, as we await to see what happens with Matt Gates and Willie, whether or not he will be confirmed as the next attorney general. But worth noting here, Ryan, even if the House Ethics Committee were to decide not to release that report, that would not preclude some of the details in that report from coming out. Some of them already have. Yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, the interview that you conducted yesterday with the uh, attorney for two of the witnesses to the committee where they, that attorney detailed what those witnesses told the committee. Uh, there's also the possibility that the Senate has its own mechanisms for investigating Matt Gates. Uh, they may ask for the information from the House. The House may give it to them. Uh, they also are asking and hoping for an FBI background check that would provide them information about Matt Gates' past conduct that may be a part of this process. So I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind here is that maybe all of this information doesn't 
become public knowledge, but that doesn't mean that it won't be in the hands of senators that would help them inform their decision as they go through this process. The other part of it that is it important for us to keep in mind is that there's going to be confirmation hearings. Uh, Matt Gates will have to sit in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee and answer tough questions, and there is the real possibility that he will be asked direct questions about some of these allegations that have come to light. So the senators are going to have a pretty good understanding of what he's accused of uh, and uh, be able to use that as part of their deliberations when it gets to that stage. What's been the reaction you've heard as you've been on the Hill today and talking with sources, talking with lawmakers, to this full court press from President-elect Trump to spend some of his fairly newly earned political capital as of the election on trying to get Gates over the finish line. This is a very significant part of this process, Hallie. I think it's very fair to say that there are not enough votes right now for Matt Gates to become the next attorney general. But the difference between right now and when this vote might take place at the end of January or in the middle of February, that is a universe of time there. And if it's one thing we know, it is that Donald Trump has enormous sway over his party, sway that only increased after the results of the election. You've already started to see the tune change from some of these senators publicly. Mark Wayne Mullen was one of uh, Matt Gaetz's biggest critics. He talked openly mm -hmm. about him bragging about his sexual exploits on the floor of the House of Representatives. Mullen now saying in an interview with our Kristen Welker over the weekend on Meet the Press that he thinks Matt Gates should have the full opportunity to go through the confirmation process. Kevin Kramer, who was also very skeptical of Matt Gates, he's with Donald Trump right now in Texas. He's part of that video that you were showing right. earlier uh, of, the, of the SpaceX launch. It's clear Donald Trump's making a hard press, and it may be very difficult for these senators when given the specific ask from their president to vote yes that they turn him down. Has there been any moving of the needle that you picked up on today of the possibility of using recess appointments? I, the more and more I talk to people about this, they view it as a distinction uh, without a difference. Okay. Either you vote to recess the, the, the Congress to give Donald Trump the opportunity to appoint one of these nominees that are controversial, or you vote to nominate one of these or confirm one of these uh, judicial or one of these uh, uh, cabinet officials that are controversial you really if you either vote is a mechanism to getting that person in office so there may be a few senators that feel that they can split hairs uh, in this direction but i ultimately think if they don't have the votes it's going to be difficult for the recess appointment process to play itself out now again everything's a live ball here maybe donald trump <laughs> pushes and, and pleads with them to do so, and they cave as a result of that pressure. Uh, but I think the first step here is to try and get 51 votes for these nominees, and then if that doesn't work, we'll see what happens with recess appointments. Ryan Noble is live for us on the Hill tonight. Ryan, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Trump is also on track to potentially score a win in New York, at least partially, with prosecutors open to possibly putting his hush money sentencing on pause for years. The proposal still needs sign off from the judge, but the Manhattan DA today is essentially saying they are still interested in sentencing Mr. Trump. They do not want to dismiss the case, but they might be open to delaying it. Remember, November 26, that was the date that President-elect Trump was set to be sentenced after he was found guilty earlier this year of falsifying business records, covering up the reimbursement for that hush money payment to an adult film star. Now, the President-elect's spokesperson is calling this a total and definitive victory for Mr. Trump and that his lawyers will continue to push for dismissal. NBC's Laura Jarrett is following this for us. So first of all, Laura, asterisk, right, on the idea that this is a total and definitive victory for Mr. Trump. It doesn't appear that it is, it is that yet, correct? Uh, not until we hear from the, the judge, Hallie. But I, I think if you start from the premise that this case took six weeks, he was in that courtroom every day. The DA pushed this case tooth and nail to make sure that it got finished. And now they're at the point where they're saying we could punt this four years. Mm -hmm. I think that is fair to call that a significant capitulation at minimum. Now, the judge is going to be the ultimate arbiter about whether this sentencing goes forward or whether it doesn't. If the Trump team gets their way, the entire case would go away, not just the sentencing, the indictment would be white clean. I think the judge is going to have a hard time swallowing that, given that the jury actually looked at all the evidence and decided to convict him. But if they don't wipe it away, Hallie, the Trump team is going to keep pursuing this. They're not going to just agree to have an indefinite thing sort of looming over him for the next four years while he's in office. I would expect to see appeals and potentially mm. even running into federal court. So that's the next thing to watch here. We don't have any timing yet from Judge Mershon. I was just going to ask. I, okay. I, yeah, but we, it, on the other hand, he can't let this go on indefinitely. He knows that he's going to be inaugurated in January. And so I think we're going to hear from him sooner rather than later, Hallie.
Uh, Laura Jarrett, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Sure. Yep. Coming up, you've got some scary moments caught on camera. We'll show you how a 13-year-old fought back against her attempted kidnapper. Plus, why a cyber attack means some empty shelves at New England grocery stores. A 13-year-old student fighting back in South Florida after getting attacked on her way home from school. Look at it, all of it captured on camera. With tonight, police telling NBC News the suspect's still out there. Here's Maya Eaglin. A mother's worst nightmare. Her daughter attacked as she walks home from school. Caught on this surveillance video provided to NBC South Florida, you can see this person in a yellow shirt running at 13-year-old student Kamora Reed. I was walking from my bus stop. I heard this guy like jogging type running behind me, so I moved out of the way. Near her bus stop in Lauder Hill, this brave teen chose to fight back. He came behind me and like grabbed my leg, started dragging me on the floor and stuff. A second angle from a neighbor, according to NBC's local station, shows Kamora on the ground wrestling the man. I was screaming like, get off of me and like, what are you doing? Not going down without a fight, her screaming and kicking, alerting a neighbor. The video shows the suspect running off while Kamora rushes home, immediately telling her mother. My daughter ran in the room and said, Mommy, someone tried to kidnap me. Kamora's mother, Lois, in shock. It was devastating and nerve-wracking, everything. But by the time she went outside to look for him, she says he was gone. Everything inside of me stirred like turn upside and down. The Lauder Hill police still haven't arrested anyone. Now more than a month later, telling us they have no updates on the case. Anyone with information is urged to contact them and a $5,000 reward is being offered. Since that afternoon, Kamora travels home from school in fear. Nervous and scared that like he might do this to somebody else. Lois now meets Kamora at the bus stop every afternoon, refusing to let her walk home alone. If you see something that's off, say something. A call for action as the search continues and a community remains on high alert. Maya Eaglin, NBC News. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police in New York City say a third person has now died after that deadly stabbing spree we told you about yesterday. Remember, the suspect carried out three apparently unprovoked stabbings at a whole bunch of locations across the city. According to city records, he had been released from jail a month earlier and had a long criminal history. He's now facing multiple charges. Number two, several Massachusetts grocery stores, including Stop and Shop, are dealing with shortages. Look at these empty shelves in some spots after a cyber attack. It's, it's affecting, in particular, meat and produce. The store's parent company says it's investigating, and they've notified police. Number three, is it possible that a cup of hot chocolate a day keeps the doctor away? I sure hope so. It's after a new study finds drinking hot chocolate could protect you from some of the negative effects of fattier foods, especially when you're stressed out just in time for the holidays. Number four, Dave Coulier is defending his Full House co-star John Stamos after some online backlash. Basically, Stamos posted on Instagram wearing a bald cap and pictures with Coulier, who, remember, revealed his cancer diagnosis on the Today Show last week. A lot of the comments were supportive, but some said, hey, Stamos should have shaved his own head in solidarity. Coulier said, hey, Stamos is a true friend. He says the gesture cheered him up. Number five, Macy's, giving our friends at today a sneak peek at some of the floats for this year's Thanksgiving Day Parade. There will be more floats next Thursday than ever before. Look at this, a pasta-themed float from Rayo's, one from the Bronx Zoo filled with life-size animal statues. That's cool. You're going to be able to watch it all right here next Thursday on NBC. Tonight, a tale of two coasts, one facing drought conditions, desperate for rain after more than a month of basically nothing, the Northeast seeing the driest fall on record. But then out west, you've got California and Oregon about to get slammed by a monster storm with potentially more than a foot of rain and dangerous flooding in some spots. Here in the east, conditions are getting worse with fires still happening across the region and the water supply is getting lower and lower, according to experts. Officials say reservoirs are just at about 60%. That's less than normal. Then in parts of California, you've got people prepping for a big hit from a big storm. And an atmospheric river is on the way, too. Bill Carrots is going to join us in a moment with more. But first, in tonight's breakdown, we've got you covered with Savannah Sellers on what the deal is. Chase Kane on what the deal is. It's a weather event, and when it's severe, it can be catastrophic. It's not a hurricane or a tornado. It's called an atmospheric river. But what exactly is that? 
Well, an atmospheric river is a narrow current of wind carrying huge plumes of moisture stretching for hundreds or even thousands of miles high in the sky, kind of like a big floating river. Technically, they're the largest rivers of fresh water on Earth, transporting on average more than double the flow of the Amazon River. And when an atmospheric river transports tropical moisture over dry land and that moisture collides with mountains, like California's Sierra Nevada range, for example, the water vapor rises and quickly cools, creating extreme rainfall and sometimes feet of snow. And while not all atmospheric rivers are dangerous, research from UCSD predicts climate change will make them more intense and more frequent, which could make flooding two or three times more likely. Well, that's a problem, especially on the West Coast, where Cal Fire says more than a million acres of land has burned this year in California alone. And wildfires make it harder for the top layer of soil to absorb water. So. When torrential rain hits, the water runs off more quickly and that can trigger flash flooding. And that's something officials are warning of today with the threat of five to upwards of 10 inches of rain along California's Redwood Coast and Northern Mountain Ranges on Wednesday. On Thursday, the threat of floods and mudslides peaks. And with this one, the National Weather Service urges people to follow local alerts and not to travel through hazardous conditions. Chase Kane, NBC News. Let me bring in Bill Karens now. Okay, so bomb cyclone situation. What's yes. going on out west? Yeah, we can add this to the bomb cyclone list. And this one's actually almost like a double bomb. Uh, a bomb cyclone just means that the storm is intensifying rapidly. You know, we measure the pressure to see if it meets the criteria. But this one doubled that criteria. And you can see it. Whenever a storm, these are the clouds, the white, whenever it kind of looks like a cinnamon bun, that's a very intense storm. In this case, you know, it's a cyclone like this. It's not, sometimes we get like an eye, it almost looks like a hurricane. Um, but this is the atmospheric river portion on the bottom. So this is that moisture coming from the central Pacific, and it's just pointing straight at California and that's going to sit there over the next couple of days. That's why all of the really huge impacts are going to be localized north of the bay and south of Portland. Southern Oregon, northern California. This will be what we call an extreme atmospheric river event. It actually looks like there's going to be three storms that are going to come through in the next six days and this atmospheric wow. river is going to point at them over that time. So this huge area in this dark reddish color, that's 10 inches of rain. This is, you know, California is a big state. This is a huge area that's going to get a ton of rain. It hasn't been that wet of a fall, so the river levels are pretty low. So initially, we're going to do okay with it, but by the time we get to Friday and Saturday, the river levels are quickly going to come up, and that's going to be problematic. And of course, with the highest elevations, we'll get snow. Mount Shasta in Northern California, the forecast is five feet of snow, and all of the mountain ranges in the Cascades and the Sierra will easily pick up two feet or more. The high winds come with these storms, too, along the coast, hurricane-type gusts. And this is the first really big atmospheric river of the season. And so, you know, this is the kind of one everyone's going to get used to this. We're in our winter season. And if you're traveling in winds like this, it can be dangerous, especially on the coast. Traveling through the mountain passes also, they're going to have to deal with that. So this is a this is that change, Hallie, we were talking about across the country. A very active weather pattern. we got that storm finally coming to the east coast, too. Uh, and that's going to be on Thursday. And that's going to be rain and snow in areas yeah. that desperately need it. Well, people are looking forward to that, that's for sure. Bill Karens, thank you very much for that, friend. Appreciate it. When we come back, what Russia is warning about nuclear weapons and what it means for the future of the war in Ukraine. Plus, why a New York priest just got demoted. And it's not only because he lets Sabrina Carpenter shoot a music video in his church. That's next. We are watching two major developments ratcheting up tensions in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. First, Vladimir Putin is putting out this chilling new nuclear doctrine, lowering the threshold for when his country may use its nuclear arsenal. That's one, right? Number two, second, you've got Ukraine carrying out its first strike inside Russia using long-range missiles supplied by the U.S., according to what two U.S. officials confirmed to NBC News. The Russian Defense Ministry claims their military shot down five out of the six missiles. I want to go to Keir Simmons on all of this. Keir, we're glad to have you with us tonight, as always. How much is this development on the nuclear doctrine that Putin laid out a uh, sort of flexing of military muscle versus a real possibility? We don't know. That's, that's the problem, really, uh, Harry. Listen, there was a moment back in 2022, in October, we now know, from uh, Western leaders who were uh, you know, involved in the conversations where the West thought that Russia might be close to firing a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine. And we only found out about it months, years later. So we don't know how dangerous this is. I have asked officials that. One said to me, I asked one out of one to, to ten. He said about a 6.5. 
Now, look, Russia has threatened uh, nuclear weapons since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, since its invasion, its illegal invasion of Ukraine, and it hasn't happened. And certainly a, a European official, senior diplomat, tells me that China has put pressure on Russia not to use nuclear weapons. So uh, they've changed the doctrine. The crucial thing that's got people worried is it says that Russia can use a, a nuclear weapon against a non-nuclear state that's allied with a nuclear state. Clearly a message to Ukraine and the US. But maybe it's a message. Uh, maybe that's maybe it's rhetoric. That's what the British Prime Minister is suggesting yeah. tonight. Uh, we also talked about that other development out of Ukraine. It felt like only a matter of time, of course, before Ukraine would use those long-range missiles supplied by the U.S. to strike inside Russia once yeah. President Biden and the administration gave them the green light to do so. What else could the Biden administration do, Kier, between now and January 19th, let's say, uh, that could that could help Ukraine in its fight against Russia? Well, not much. I mean, I'll say there is one Ukrainian politician who is talking about wanting Western troops. And President Macron of France has suggested that at one point. But there's no way that the Biden administration would approve anything like that. So uh, this is the last ditch thing, really, isn't it? I, yeah. Listen, I think a lot of this is really about actually about President elect Trump, about mm. The fact that he has said he will demand a deal, that he's told uh, the American electorate that he will get peace in, in Ukraine. So what's happening, and it happens so often when militaries can see that there may be a ceasefire, there's an escalation. So you've got those tens of thousands of Russian troops and potentially, and also North Korean troops, uh, ready for an offensive to try and push the Ukrainians out of that Kursk area uh, of Russia. And you've got the American administration now saying that Ukraine can use these long-range weapons about trying to counter that offensive, but also about trying to send its own tough message. You send a tough message before you negotiate. I mean, that's, that's the principle. Keir Simmons, uh, live for us on all of those developments tonight. Keir, thank you very much. The crackdown of political dissent in Hong Kong just went a step further today with the government sentencing 45 activists, pro-democracy demonstrators, lawmakers, politicians to prison. The longest punishment, 10 years behind bars. You may remember back in 2019, widespread, kind of chaotic pro-democracy protests that really rocked Hong Kong. That led to China passing a sweeping crackdown on free speech the next year, the so-called national security law, which prompted dissidents to hold unofficial primaries. They were trying to fight the new law. Well, it's those unofficial primaries now landing them in prison. This is what Hong Kong's security secretary said today. <laughs> We believe that this sentencing reflects the severity of the crime and also demonstrates that crimes endangering national security must be strictly punished. Clearly not everyone agrees with that position. I want to bring in NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer, who's been following every step of the story. Uh, where do we begin, Janice? Is it with the leader of this group who got the longest sentence? Is it with the 44 others here? Uh, take your pick because there's a lot of developments tonight. Hallie, all but two of 47 were given jail sentences, the toughest 10 years for Benny Tai. He's a former law professor that prosecutors saw as the ringleader of this effort to hold a primary vote ahead of the city's election, the election that traditionally involves candidates that have been handpicked by Beijing. Now, authorities painted him as this dangerous force who wanted to overthrow the city's political system. But for critics and families of those sentenced today, they see this trial as the end of rule of law in Hong Kong. Uh, one of the oldest being sent to jail is a well-known pro-democracy activist known as Long Hair. This is what his wife had to say today. You can say that uh, it's, a, it's a good news that we, there's no more harsh uh, uh, imprisonment. But I want to emphasize one thing very clear, that it is unfair try and it's an unreasonable try. Long hair will be in his 70s by the time he's released, Hallie. How about another name associated with this movement? Probably the, one of the biggest um, when you talk about pro-democracy activism in Hong Kong, and that's Jimmy Lai. He's in court tomorrow? Yeah, he is a publisher who had a newspaper called Apple Daily. Jimmy Lai was arrested in 2020. He's been in solitary confinement. Tomorrow will be the first time he takes the stand in his defense. This is a trial that was supposed to last 80 days, and it's dragged on with breaks for at least a year. Jimmy Lai's health has been deteriorating, according to his son and rights groups. And there are international calls from the U.N. down to rights campaigners 
who are wanting to have him released. But he's facing very serious charges of collusion with foreign forces and subversion, again, under this national security law that was imposed in 2020. Is this the end of the, the push for democracy in Hong Kong? What does the movement look like after today? Well, the law was Beijing's response to the protests in Hong Kong in 2019. And the government here said it was necessary to stop what it saw as challenges to China's sovereignty. It's now created this environment where there's a crackdown on media and even certain slogans on a T-shirt can be considered a crime. And digital surveillance has been stepped up. When I last spoke with Joshua Wong, who's one of the more prominent faces of the pro-democracy movement, he said, we're never going to give up and we're never going to stop fighting. But then there were the arrests and now this mass trial and a lot of people believing that if it has not killed the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, it has certainly pushed it into the shadows uh, to a point where the U.S. has stepped forward to condemn it and to say that this is uh, another step toward tarnishing Hong Kong's international reputation. Hallie. Janice Mackey for our live for us there in Beijing. We're so glad to have you there, Janice. Thank you very much for breaking it down for us tonight. I appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Midwest Bureau, two people are dead and a third has been put in the hospital after this house explosion. You see that on the left side of your screen there. It exploded and then caught on fire in Ohio. A doorbell camera across the street or nearby captured it. People in homes nearby said they could feel it. Police are investigating the cause, of course. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the New York priest who let Sabrina Carpenter film a music video at his church has now been demoted. That's after the investigation found other instances of mismanagement, like the unauthorized transfer of nearly $2 million in church funds. The priest's attorney tells our affiliate the expenses were authorized as part of his compensation deal. Also out of our Northeast Bureau, Delta says it'll start serving Shake Shack on its flights out of Boston next month. There is a catch, and I, I hate to tell you the catch, <laughs> only if you fly uh, first class on trips longer than 900 miles. So if you can swing that, you're probably getting as much Shake Shack at home as you want. The airline plans to expand the service to some other American markets over the next year. Coming up here on the show, what Texas is doing to try to get more Bibles into schools and how parents are reacting. That's next. Texas has taken another step today closer to bringing the Bible into public schools. In a preliminary vote today, you had the State Board of Education backing a new optional curriculum that would incorporate themes and lessons from the Bible into classes taught to students at public schools as young as five years old, the students at least. The vote was close. It was not unanimous. It was eight to seven. And it wasn't partisan either. Three Republicans joined four Democrats in voting against. Here's some of the, the comments from the public. Our schools are to educate, not to indoctrinate. This curriculum veers towards indoctrination. Our children need instructional material that contain the Old and the New Testament, like the Bible, where it says, train the child in the way of the Lord, and when it grows up, it will not turn from it. A final vote should come later this week. I want to bring in NBC's Yasmin Vasugin, who's been looking into this for us. And Yas, you actually talked with some parents here who laid out how they feel about it. Yeah, I, I think the vote number, Hal, that you brought up is actually pretty important to kind of start at this conversation because, as you mentioned, right, three Republicans siding with um, Democrats there arriving on that eight to seven vote and the passage of this first vote, by the way, the second one will be um, later this week to finalize where they land on this decision, including this um, curriculum in Texas public school systems. But if you're someone who supports um, this measure, essentially the argument that's being made is that the Bible is part of American history and integral to public school students learning about the Bible and subsequently Christianity as well. Um, and that also it promotes literacy. But, but I did speak to some parents who are very much against this measure. And while they are not against necessarily talking about and teaching religion in schools, they want it to be equal opportunity, right? If you're going to learn about Christianity, then you should learn about Islam. You should learn about um, Judaism and all the other religions as well. And if you're going to learn about the good in these religions, you also need to learn about the bad. Here's some of what Lainey had to say. She's a mom in North Texas of four kids. I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. I'm unsurprised. 
Uh, but I'm also really worried. Our concern is a singular narrow ideology being forced upon our children. Uh, and we really believe these important conversations don't belong in curriculum. So final vote, Hal, is Thursday. And if, in fact, um, it passes, which we expect it to do, uh, this curriculum will be instituted in these public schools in September of 2025. And they're saying, by the way, it is voluntary. However, there are financial rewards to the public schools that decide to integrate this curriculum into their schools. It feels pretty, uh, you know, all but certain that there will be legal challenges yeah. if this does end up passing here. I have to think that uh, sort of given the process, there's a chance that it may end up at the Supreme Court. Yeah, I mean, that's what everybody's saying. The folks that are supporting this measure feel pretty confident it'll get through the Supreme Court as well. And they're looking back to a, dis to a decision two years ago in which I'm sure many folks remember it was a coach who essentially they decided in favor of him being able to prey on the field, not separating essentially church and state in that measure. And so folks saying that this is going to go all the way to the Supreme Court, those that are against this measure are worried about that. Those that are for it think um, it's going to live even in the Supreme Court. Yasmin Vasugian, thank you for being all over this one for us uh, and watching it, as I know you will, in the days to come since we expect that decision. Thanks. Coming up here on the show, what the world's biggest store is saying about how much stuff we are all buying ahead of the holidays. That's next. So we're getting an early, very early read on holiday spending. And it looks like, at least at America's biggest store, people are buying more stuff. Walmart says sales are up, reporting in their latest earnings that people are spending more on stuff like toys and stuff for your house. That's even as prices are still going up for some essentials like groceries. That doesn't seem to be stopping folks. Brian Chung is joining us to break it all down. This is so interesting, Brian, because this tracks with something that you and I have talked about. I've talked about with our colleague, Christine Romans. While people will, on the one hand, say they don't feel good about the economy, they feel like things are expensive, watch what they do, right? And that's their, they're spending money still, right? Yeah, well, and people might say that the overall economy nationally doesn't look good, but their finances look okay, and it's underscored by the spending that we've seen so far. But what is interesting is that people might be cutting corners in the other holidays this year so they can spend for the big holidays at the end of this year. That's underscored by the National Retail Federation coming out with some really interesting statistics showing they project an increase in the spending for this particular holiday season from $875 billion, these are billion dollars of figures, uh, in 2023 to 903 billion dollars in 2024. But look at all the other holidays, back to school, Halloween, Mother's Day, other expected big spending weekends. Yeah, well, you're seeing those figures actually lower on a year mm -hmm. over year basis. So again, people are just maybe cutting corners in some holidays so that they can really, uh, you know, blow the bag for uh, for the holidays at the end of the year. What about this idea that folks are hearing a lot about right now of like doom spending? Yeah, well, look, doom spending, the idea there is that because of everything that's going on in the world, it, it applied most uh, m most to the pandemic, right, when people were stuck inside and they wanted to get back out there and go to the mall and splurge a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, that is still certainly happening when you look at just certainly what we've gone through in 2024. We had the election. Uh, we've had drought here in the Northeast. I mean, you know, a lot of things that people are just, all right, you know what, let's try to get my mind off of this and go to the mall, right? But also in impacting this is the shorter holiday season. We have to remember that actually Cyber Monday they will fall on December. It will be December 1st. So that gives you less time between uh, Black Friday and Christmas this year. And then the deal hunting mentality with inflation still out there. So people might be looking at all these things in tandem and going, you know what? I'm going to make this holiday season a big one. You got to have something underneath the tree. So yes, despite everything else in the world, it might <laughs> seem like doom, but at least I can open up my wallet and give myself a little retail therapy. So dang, Brian, like I felt like I already had enough stress in my life. And now I'm like, I haven't even started holiday. Neither shopping. have I. Like, What's on your list? What's the bit? What's like the hot I, thing for you I and need, for people generally? I need new contacts, as you can see. This is a new feature. This is a new feature. So I gotta, I gotta look at I my FSA. I wasn't gonna mention my... the specs. It's a new look for you. And yeah, I'm, no, I, I, I think, need, I need yeah. a new supply of contacts. New proof. <laughs> All right. All right, friend, we'll send you on some HJN contacts for the holidays. Thank you so much, <laughs> Ryan Chung. Appreciate you as always. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now.
minute that SpaceX Starship is expected to reappear essentially on its way back down to Earth after a launch about an hour ago. We are going to take you there live after it did not land back in those chopstick pincers as expected. You know who's at that launch? President-elect Trump. He's also now making staff picks really quickly. What his all-hands-on-deck push looks like to try to get his embattled attorney general pick, Matt Gates, confirmed. Plus, a tale of two coasts, why the east needs rain, while out west, an atmospheric river is expected to just get them soaked. Plus, in Miami, some pretty stunning video shows a 13-year-old student fighting off attackers on the way home from school. But police now want the public's help finding the suspect. Then, health officials sounding alarm bells over a rise in cases of walking pneumonia, especially among kids. But they want you to know before you get together for Thanksgiving, coming up a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we are starting with some breaking news, because any second now, we're expecting to see part of the world's biggest and most powerful rocket come back down to Earth. I want to show you a live look now at one part of the two-piece mega rocket. This is the Starship back in the Earth's atmosphere right now. It's actually about to splash down, we think, in the ocean after a less than successful start. If you were watching at the top of the last hour, so just about 60 minutes ago, almost exactly, the other part of the rocket, the booster, ended up landing there in the Gulf of Mexico. You see it? That's not actually what was supposed to happen. That's not what SpaceX had wanted to happen. It, the SpaceX wanted it to go back into these sort of chopstick-looking things, these metal pincers. That's what it looked like this time. They wanted it to look more like the last time. Look at this. When SpaceX tested this in October and it worked, you're about to see that. With a whole lot of questions now about what this mixed bag test mean for Elon Musk's goals. Remember, this is all part of his big push to try to use Starship to someday take humans to the moon, maybe even Mars. It's not just the mega rocket getting a lot of the attention. It's uh, the folks getting a front row seat as well. We've just seen President-elect Trump there. You watch that live. Of course, he and Musk, there they are, have developed a close relationship. And he's even asked Musk to come on board as part of this sort of government efficiency program that he's launching outside the formal bounds of government. But he's a critical informal advisor to the, pres the president-elect. I want to bring Gladys Schwartz in now. Gladys, we'll get to the politics of this in a second. But let me start with, like, the actual piece of what we're watching here. It's not a total win for SpaceX, but it's not a total sort of failure either. They're still getting some key information and watching the piece that's supposed to happen now. That's right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this down because I'm, I'm watching the feed right now and things are going to get uh, real hairy. Uh, that starship is coming down over the Indian Ocean. And before we get any further, I got to tell you, this shot that you're seeing right now, things can get real swirly, uh, squirrely very quickly. Um, if you think that this is like a brand new starship, it, it is not. Uh, I've been listening to the feed and, and this is... Uh, kind of like a beater starship. They've actually shaved off uh, 2,100 of the heat tiles underneath. The last time they did this, uh, we saw a lot of work go into the heat shields to protect the starship. This time, they're stress testing this starship. They are adjusting the angle of attack, so it comes in at a much steeper angle. Uh, there's a chance that this thing is going to blow up, disintegrate. Uh, it'll, it'll be a big explosion, possibly over the Indian Ocean, and they're prepping for that possibility, but so far, Far, even without those 2,100 heat shields that they removed for this, uh, it is still uh, holding up from what we can see. It's, the speed is dropping down. Uh, the speed right now is about uh, 6,000 kilometers an hour as it comes down over the Indian Ocean. And the reason why they, they peeled back a lot of those heat shields is because they want to stress test it. They want to see how far they can push this starship. And interestingly enough, Hallie, they pulled off some of the heat shields and some of the heat shields they left kind of uh, exposed uh, wh right where the hole is because those are places where in the future they want to put attachments so that it can also be catched. Uh, it, it can also be caught, uh, mm. if you will, by that crazy chopstick-looking uh, landing pad. And, and so we've never seen that before. Yeah. There is talk that that might possibly happen uh, in two launches from now. Okay. Uh, the next launch, we will see like a, a totally reworked second-generation uh, Starship with a, a whole different heat shield setup. Uh, but this one, again, kind of like the beater Starship. They are pushing this as far as they can uh, just to see how much it can hold up to. And so far, you can see that picture right there. I mean, it is holding up as it is now clearly in the yeah. uh, the inside of like the Earth's atmosphere. We saw a bunch of plasma coming up uh, around that uh, that starship. That that shot is absolutely remarkable. I it look is at that. In I know. And I up. think. And, and it's not gliding. I mean, it looks like it's gliding from us. No, this is like 
plummeting down to earth at a thousand kilometers an hour right now. It should be splashing down maybe in the next uh, minute, minute or so. But Hallie, it is a remarkable shot. And to think that this is being broadcast live because of those Starlink satellites that, again, have been like this uh, side hustle for SpaceX that, yeah. that started off as a, hey, we've got a bunch of uh, whole spaces we're launching up and we're trying to make reusable rockets. Might as well put satellites up while we're at it. And now it's kind of changed the way uh, the satellite transmission game happens here on Earth. But we're seeing it all happen live there on the screen. It's pretty remarkable. It is right there on the left side of the screen. That's what people are seeing live. You know, it, it makes me laugh, Gotti, because uh, sometimes we can't even get your cover. live shot up uh, from, from L.A. there. Let's listen in for a second <laughs> as we, we get ready Can we to... listen in? Yeah. yeah. Now the uh, Raptor engines will relight and help flip the booster back up. This is a more severe flip given the orientation. Uh, the engines will shut down prior to the water making impact, required to the vehicle making impact with the water. Our ship is doing great so far. There's, There's those engines the relighting. What a great reorientation by Starship. Wow. All three down to two, into the water. Wow. Gosh, that, uh, Hallie, I mean, <laughs> that is, we what? That is wild. Okay, so, so to just, to, uh, just to explain what we just saw happen, you Take it see away, all pal. those shots. Those are coming from buoys. They planned this launch window, hoping that they could get this during daylight hours. We've never seen something like this because in the past it's happened uh, at night. And so we haven't seen what it's looked like for Starship to come down like that. But I mean, that was like you could see, uh, you know, looking down in the future, a controlled a descent like that. It is possible that this could be caught, this massive contraption could be caught by those arms. And again, this was all about stress testing Starship. They took off 2,100 heat shields. It still survived all the way down to the ocean. Uh, they never thought that they were going to be able to recover this Starship. They were like, you know, this one's gone. We've got a next generation coming up. And to see it make that soft landing like that after so many heat shields were removed, it, it really goes to show that the next generation is going to be even better shielded than that. And it's this, the, the landing that we just saw is going to give SpaceX so much information about where they can put the attachments that are going to allow for that starship, the starship, again, this is the part that's going to carry humans eventually into space. That starship can come back down to Earth and be caught by the arms of yeah. that, um, that Mechazilla. Uh, so yeah, just a glimpse into the future as we see that is a super heavy coming down right there. That was uh, about an hour that ago. Was, uh, yep. Came down pretty controlled. Uh, something must have gone wrong with either the catch tower or the, uh, the ship 33 Raptor engines firing underneath there. But you see it comes down uh, vertically and uh, splashes down there off the coast of uh, Texas. And then what we just saw in the Indian Ocean, that is, that is the wild stuff today. And again, this isn't a perfect scenario. This was them kind of throwing up uh, like a, a, a starship that they never really thought was going to show its resilience as, as well as it did. And uh, at SpaceX, it's a, it's a big victory, especially when it comes to, um, yeah. to how Starship performed. Hey, Gotti, do you um, like have an interest in space? Like, is that something you're into? Dude, just, send me up to hard, send me up to right tell. now. Like, um, let's go, <laughs> let's go. I think our bosses are listening, so I'm just saying, careful what you actually say live on yes. there. Uh, Gotti Schwartz, oh gosh, fascinating please. to see. Thank you so much for that super smart breakdown, friend. Sure. It's great to see you, and I know we're going to see more of it coming up on your show. Stay tuned now, coming up in just a couple of hours from now. Thanks, Gotti, appreciate it. So listen, one of the people that you saw there at that SpaceX launch, President-elect Trump, he flew from his home in South Florida over to Texas to be with his friend, his confidant, Elon Musk, in this moment, along with a number of others, as he is continuing to make selections for who he wants to serve in his administration next year, including the guy you see on the left. You recognize him? That's Dr. Oz.
He's uh, been picked to lead the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The guy on the right may be less familiar to you. His name is Howard Lutkin, uh, Lutnick. Rather. He's very familiar to, of course, those in the Trump orbit. He's the Counter Fitzgerald CEO. He's the transition co-chair. He's going to lead the Commerce Department if he's confirmed. You have Donald Trump naming 29 people already to cabinet-level top positions, compared to just three by this point in 2016. But it's this guy, Matt Gates who's facing perhaps the most controversy here, the president-elect's pick to serve as the attorney general. There's this House vote tomorrow to decide whether or not, uh, in fact, there should be this report. This is gonna, they're going to talk about this investigation, this report that they put together related to sexual misconduct allegations against Mr. Gates, as well as allegations of illicit drug use, both of which he denies. Now, President-elect Trump was asked in just the last maybe 45 minutes or so, is he reconsidering his support of Matt Gates? I want to play it for you. Are you reconsidering the nomination of Matt Gates? No. All right. So you have Donald Trump saying publicly what I think a lot of outlets, including NBC News, have been reporting privately, that Mr. Trump was working the phones. He was trying to get out there to rally support uh, for Matt Gates, as Gates himself was also doing. I want to bring in now uh, our Capitol Hill correspondent, Ryan Nobles, who's got more for us on this. And Ryan, there's a lot here. Um, and I want to start with that news that we got from President-elect Trump just a moment ago. Uh, we know that he has been backing Matt Gates. We know that that has been something that he's been wanting, even as there is some, uh, some, some concern that maybe Matt Gates is not going to get over the finish line here. Yeah, I think that's a pretty revealing uh, back and forth uh, from the president-elect. And even though he didn't say much, uh, it speaks volumes about just how commit committed he is to seeing Matt Gates as the next attorney general. And by extension, how much he is willing to go head to head with his fellow Republicans that serve in the United States Senate and force them to take a tough vote on Gates and his confirmation. Uh, you know, I, this has long been about a contest between Trump's political will versus the institution of the United States Senate. Uh, privately, many of these senators are not comfortable with the idea of Matt Gates as the next attorney general, but they are also very, very nervous about challenging Donald Trump and his uh, political standing right now, especially in the wake of this decisive election victory. And so I think what most Senate Republicans, how they would like to see this play out is they signal to the uh, incoming administration that, hey, we really don't want to vote for this. Why don't we change course and go somewhere else? It seems pretty clear that what Donald Trump wants to do, at least right now, is get them on the record, which is going to make for a very awkward few weeks uh, when we get back after the holidays. Um, Ryan, let me bring in somebody else who knows uh, all things related to President-elect Trump, and that's Von Hilliard, who we see on the right side of our screen here. What's the view from where you are down in West Palm Beach? The President-elect will, of course, be returning back from Texas at some point, uh, and he has some other picks to make as well. Right, and let's be clear. That was actually, we believe, President-elect Trump's first time answering a question since yeah. winning the presidency now two weeks ago. and. We so far have a one-word response, and it was a defiant one, no. Wait, when was it? it? He hasn't, his, uh, you're right, I guess say. he's not done any, well, he answered questions on the phone to Chris no, Walker. He's, but not on camera. That is, that is, he's done not, some, on he, he, that is right, not on camera, that is accurate. Right, not on camera. He did a couple print he, interviews, he, too, I think, where he spoke you're to reporters. Right. I appreciate you keeping me I'm on I'm not sorry, on I'm not we trying to put you on the spot. On that just blew my mind for a second. It's still so interesting that he's not done a news conference. He's not gotten out there in that moment, right? Right. Right. How about this? Is the guy that's hanging down here in West Palm, it would be great to have the opportunity to ask him some more questions about these picks, but we haven't had that opportunity to see him for those reporters that are hanging down here in Florida for a little extended uh, November stay. Look, for Donald Trump, the part about this is, is unlike eight years ago, when he was well into November and December making picks, he's really had a rapid fire over the last five, six days now of these announcements. Just today, he named Mehmet Oz is going to head CMS overseeing Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, this is for Donald Trump, really sort of a clear, by going with Matt Gates and standing behind him, a clear recognition that this go around, he is not picking, as promised, anybody who he questions the loyalty of or their pursuit of his agenda through the departments and agencies that he is tasking them to lead. And even if it means it may be a close uh, a confirmation and contentious confirmation hearing and process, he's going to pick the person that he wants to fill those capacities yeah. and who he be, feels like is going to be loyal and, and see that through uh, while he's in the White House. 
Ryan, back to you on Capitol Hill. There is a nexus here. We know that J.D. Vance is actually heading to the Hill uh, based on our reporting here to try to drum up support for the cabinet picks, presumably including, of course, Matt Gates. W give us a gut check of the sense that you're getting among specifically Republican senators, not just on Gates, but generally to some of the ideas that President-elect Trump and his team have been floating, like this idea of recess appointments, et cetera. Because for now, at least until the new Senate's sworn, and it's Mitch McConnell who's still the majority leader. Uh, talk us through that dynamic. Yeah, and I should point out, J.D. Vance was here today. Uh, he wasn't meeting with senators, but he was, uh, you know, in checking out his hideaway and made uh, some, uh, went down to the floor, uh, reconnected with some of his fellow senators. He is still a sitting United States senator. And so uh, we do expect him to be here uh, later this week, uh, maybe perhaps even walking Matt Gates around and participating in some of these interviews. Uh, so what it shows is, first of all, the weight that the transition and the incoming Trump administration is putting behind these picks, uh, that they're using the vice president who is their vice president elect, who is a current senator, as a way to sell that message. But there is still a degree of institutionalism that exists in the Senate uh, that is very concerned about the way that this process is moving forward. And that includes this idea of recess appointments. The Senate is still a co-equal branch of government. They have a say in this, in this advise and consent role. And by going the recess appointment route, which means that they would adjourn, and once they're out for more than 10 days, the president can put in whoever he wants without any sort of Senate confirmation, that still has a lot of them nervous. And in fact, there was some talk that maybe Mitch McConnell, who is still going to be a senator, even though he's not the Senate majority leader, has concerns about it. He addressed that today. Listen to what he said. No, uh, there have been all kinds of rumors floating around, but I haven't addressed that issue. We'll just see how this unfolds. We've got a, six weeks here, or actually two months. So he didn't want to touch that. <laughs> but what is pretty clear is that he wasn't saying, yeah, it's okay, you can go through with these recess appointments. He's saying, let's let this process play itself out. Uh, you know, I, I think there is kind of a growing sense that uh, the recess appointment route uh, is not necessarily the way forward for uh, these Trump nominations. The best way for these nominees to get confirmed is to get 51 votes in the Senate, which should not be that tough of an ask, given the fact that they'll likely have 53 yeah. Republican senators after January 3rd. Listen, you noted, Ryan, and I'll go to you on this, it's, um, there are some controversial picks here, right? And I think the attention is currently on Matt Gates because of some of the dy dynamics unfolding. But there are other picks. Pete Hegseth, for example, who is facing uh, his own allegation of sexual misconduct, which his lawyer maintains his innocence on, says the inter interaction in 2017 was consensual. There's also Von Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the president-elect's pick to run the health agency of the nation, who is... Kennedy, of course, an anti-vaccine conspiracy theorist, and with a news outlet today putting out some video that they say is a speech from four years ago, so August of 2020, like max pandemic era, right, where Kennedy questioned whether the COVID pandemic was planned, he says, by the government. Here, here it is. Many people argue that this pandemic was a pandemic, that it was planned from the outset, that it's part of a sinister scheme. I can't tell you the answer to that. I don't have enough evidence. A lot of it feels very planned to me, but I don't know. It feels planned to him, he says. If it was planned, which it was not, it would have been planned under the administration of Donald Trump, who is the person who is appointing Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who he's become close to, to this position leading HHS. How are people supposed to square that? You're supposed to square it from Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s beliefs in pushing the conspiracy theory that the FDA, the CDC, are comprised of career officials, civil workers, who have the pharmaceutical company's best interests in mind. And that is in order to advance vaccines and advance the need for Moderna and other pharmaceutical companies to have mass vaccinations around the country and demand for their products, that therefore there's questionable interest in making the case that Americans need vaccines for things like a pandemic, which of course, all the science says that COVID was real and that vaccines helped save Americans' lives. Yet Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is somebody here during the pandemic was openly saying that the FDA was wrong to grant some emergency authorization for several of the different COVID vaccines. And for Robert F. Kennedy Jr., clearly he sees this opportunity with the Trump administration as a, as a clear pathway to enact the change and remove some of these individuals who he has long been skeptical of within some of these key health agencies.
Vaughn Hilliard, uh, Ryan Nobles. Thanks to the both of you. Appreciate you both uh, staying late or than usual, or you're always here this late. So thanks for just doing doing your jobs. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate y'all. <laughs> just in the last uh, couple hours on Capitol Hill, you had a day of, you know, intense questions, you could say, for the FEMA administrator. It just wrapped up here with the agency's leader now promising to investigate allegations of bias against Trump supporters in their hurricane responses earlier this year. At the center of attention for Republicans on these two House committees, claims by an agency worker who said she was told by higher-ups to skip over houses that had signs out, like Trump signs, signs supporting Donald Trump. You see that text here, avoid homes advertising Trump, a text that set off a heated moment. Watch this. Is Miss Washington lying to us? Uh, Miss Washington uh, has... She said it's common practice. You said it's reprehensible and isolated. Both statements can't be true. So someone's not giving us the facts. And I'm kind of trying to figure out who's not telling the truth. The actions that Miss Washington took were unacceptable. Hurricanes Helene and Milton, of course, did just unbelievable damage to parts of the southeast. And the response, of course, has been in part criticized, partly because of falsehood, things that were said weren't true, lies, conspiracy theories promoted by then-candidate Donald Trump. NBC's Stephanie Gosk is live from Old Fort, North Carolina, just outside Asheville. Um, Steph, we're going to get to why, what you're seeing on the ground there in a second, but let me pick up on the thread of this hearing here and what the FEMA administrator is now promising to try to get to the bottom of. Explain how this is going to work. Yeah, so all of this comes from a, an employee for FEMA who, as you saw those text messages, mm -hmm. also told the people that she was working with not to go to houses with Trump signs. There is evidence of it. And the FEMA administrator today, Deanna Criswell, told Congress that as soon as she found uh, evidence of that, that this employee was fired. But they were asking some very pointed questions about who else may have known about this. Is this a culture at FEMA? Some real concerns that in, in these areas where people need so much help that there may be partisan agendas driving where that help would end up. Now, what the administrator said was they are investigating it. If it looks like anyone else violated FEMA policy, then they too could possibly lose their jobs uh, as, as punishment. But that, that investigation is still ongoing and they're trying to get to the bottom of it. Beyond that, she said that it is reprehensible that anyone would not deliver aid equally among all Americans who were hurt by these unbelievable and historic storms. And she says it's a violation of policy and is not part of the culture of her agency, Hallie. Um, Steph, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you're there for us in Old Ford in North Carolina because it matters what happens in Washington, but you could argue it matters more what happens on the ground, right, and how people on the ground feel. You are there. You are talking with these folks. This is one of the hardest hit places right. after Helene. How are they? Where are they on this? Yeah, well, first, let me explain where I am. I'm, I am at a temporary shelter uh, neighborhood of sorts being set up by FEMA. People haven't moved in yet, but they will be moving okay. in. They're going to have to stay here, a lot of people for a long period of time. The need is so great here. The governor of North Carolina saying that this is the worst storm to ever hit North Carolina. Combined, the recovery, or the damage rather, between these two storms across the country is $170 billion. But there have been some frustrations with FEMA, especially here in North Carolina, that people, FEMA was not on the ground um, in hard hit areas as soon as it needed to get on the ground. And we spoke to a woman who just, uh, has one of the most horrifying survivor stories that I have heard from these two storms. But she is also now without a house mm. and she is looking for assistance. She says she's gotten some from local government, but that she has seen very little, only that $750 immediate needs check, very little in terms of what she may need to rebuild her home. Listen to what she said to me. Show me where you've been helping people. You have to explain where this dollar went and where that dollar went. Show me where you've helped, because I haven't really seen anybody that I know that's really received any real help. And it's been weeks. It's been weeks. It's been weeks. Melinda Williams there, obviously frustrated and also over overcoming the trauma of that day. She, she actually floated away with her house. It is a miracle that she's surviving at all, but to recover, she needs a lot of assistance, Hallie. Stephanie Gosk, um, it is, it is so, go so good that you are there. Um, we're glad to have you tonight. Steph, thank you. We'll look for more, of course, coming up tonight on Nightly. Thank you.
Also tonight, a tale of two coasts, right? One facing drought conditions, desperate for rain, with the Northeast seeing the driest fall on record. And the West Coast about to get slammed by a monster storm, maybe more than a foot of rain set to come down, dangerous flooding in some spots. In the East, you've got conditions getting worse. Look at this, fires across the region. And adding to the issue, experts say that there's not enough water, that the water supply is shrinking, with reservoirs at just about 60%. That's less than usual. In parts of California, on the other hand, people are prepping for a big hit from a major storm and atmospheric rivers on the way, too. Bill Karens is going to join us in a minute for more. But if you're wondering, what does the atmospheric river actually do? What's the impact going to be? Here's Chase Kane with tonight's breakdown. It's a weather event, and when it's severe, it can be catastrophic. It's not a hurricane or a tornado. It's called an atmospheric river. But what exactly is that? Well, an atmospheric river is a narrow current of wind carrying huge plumes of moisture stretching for hundreds or even thousands of miles high in the sky, kind of like a big floating river. Technically, they're the largest rivers of freshwater on Earth, transporting on average more than double the flow of the Amazon River. And when an atmospheric river transports tropical moisture over dry land and that moisture collides with mountains, like California's Sierra Nevada range, for example, the water vapor rises and quickly cools, creating extreme rainfall and sometimes feed of snow. And while not all atmospheric rivers are dangerous, research from UCSD predicts climate change will make them more intense and more frequent, which could make flooding two or three times more likely. Well, that's a problem, especially on the West Coast, where Cal Fire says more than a million acres of land has burned this year in California alone. And wildfires make it harder for the top layer of soil to absorb water. So when torrential rain hits, the water runs off more quickly and that can trigger flash flooding. And that's something officials are warning of today with the threat of five to upwards of 10 inches of rain along California's Redwood Coast and Northern Mountain Ranges on Wednesday. On Thursday, the threat of floods and mudslides peaks. And with this one, the National Weather Service urges people to follow local alerts and not to travel through hazardous conditions. Chase Kane, NBC News. Let me bring in Bill Karens now. Okay, so bomb cyclone situation. What's yes. going on out west? Yeah, we can add this to the bomb cyclone list. And this one's actually almost like a double bomb. Uh, a bomb cyclone just means that the storm is intensifying rapidly. You know, we measure the pressure to see if it meets the criteria. But this one doubled that criteria. And you can see it. Whenever a storm, these are the clouds, the white, whenever it kind of looks like a cinnamon bun, that's a very intense storm. In this case, you know, it's a cyclone like this. It's not, sometimes we get like an eye, it almost looks like a hurricane. Um, but this is the atmospheric river portion on the bottom. So this is that moisture coming from the central Pacific, and it's just pointing straight at California, and that's going to sit there over the next couple of days. That's why all of the really huge impacts are going to be localized north of the bay and south of Portland, southern Oregon, northern California. This will be what we call an extreme atmospheric river event. It actually looks like there's going to be three storms that are going to come through in the next six days, and this atmospheric wow. river is going to point at them over that time. So this huge area in this dark reddish color, that's 10 inches of rain. This is, you know, California is a big state. This is a huge area that's going to get a a ton of rain. It hasn't been that wet of a fall, so the river levels are pretty low. So initially, we're going to do okay with it, but by the time we get to Friday and Saturday, the river levels are quickly going to come up, and that's going to be problematic. And of course, the highest elevations will get snow. Mount Shasta in Northern California, the forecast is five feet of snow, and all of the mountain ranges in the Cascades and the Sierra will easily pick up two feet or more. The high winds come with these storms, too, along the coast, hurricane-type gusts. And this is the first really big atmospheric river of the season. And so, you know, this is the kind of one everyone's going to get used to this. We're in our winter season. And if you're traveling in winds like this, it can be dangerous, especially on the coast. Traveling through the mountain passes also, they're going to have to deal with that. So this is a this is that change, Hallie, we were talking about across the country. A very active weather pattern. we got that storm finally coming to the east coast, too. Uh, and that's going to be on Thursday. And that's going to be rain and snow in areas yeah. that desperately need it. Well, people are looking forward to that, that's for sure. Bill Karen, thank you very much for that, friend. Appreciate it. Health officials are now warning about a rise in walking pneumonia. This is basically a milder form of pneumonia, so people might feel okay, like, up and moving around. But experts say they're seeing numbers go up on this, especially in kids. Each year, about 2 million Americans are infected, although health officials think that could actually be an undercount. Right now, the warning is that doctors should be looking out for this. I want to bring in Dr. Natalie Azar for more on this. Okay, so what do we know about why cases have gone up? Let's start there. 
Yeah, you know, Holly, I, I think most of us are still speculating that it has to do with coming out of lockdown and the pandemic. You know, this is mycoplasma pneumonia, which is the bacteria that is typically causing um, walking pneumonia is a respiratory virus. Um, and so it's spread by all the ways we know, respiratory droplets and coughing and sneezing and everything like that. The steepest rise, according to the CDC, is in kids age two to four, where it went from about 1% to 7% of cases. And think about that. Some of those kids are really entering their, their first, second, or or even third winter, and they just never had exposure yeah. to mycoplasma in the past, and they never built up any immunity. We're heading into the holiday season. That's obviously a time when people are getting together. They are, you know, in close quarters, et cetera. Is there anything you can do, or is just like general good practices, wash your hands, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, all of that matters, but I, I do think it's important for, um, you know, parents and caregivers to be aware of, of the signs and symptoms of mycoplasma. So typically in most individuals, it's going to cause a typical sore throat, cough, fever. In little kids, it can also cause some GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting. And the thing is that it does and should be treated with antibiotics, Hallie. So if you are suspecting it, and especially if it's in an area where we're seeing that, um, you know, bump in cases, take your child to the pediatrician and get tested because they, uh, they can be treated very effectively with antibiotics. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Coming up, a pretty scary scene out of Oklahoma. We're going to show you this fire at a refinery, how officials think it started. Look at that. Plus, police in Brazil uncovering an alleged plot to kill the then-president-elect days before the inauguration. We'll explain. A 13-year-old student fighting back in South Florida after getting attacked on her way home from school. Look at it, all of it captured on camera. With tonight, police telling NBC News the suspect's still out there. Here's Maya Eaglin. A mother's worst nightmare. Her daughter attacked as she walks home from school. Caught on this surveillance video provided to NBC South Florida, you can see this person in a yellow shirt running at 13-year-old student Kamora Reed. I was walking from my bus stop. I heard this guy like jogging type running behind me, so I moved out of the way. Near her bus stop in Lauder Hill, this brave teen chose to fight back. He came behind me and like grabbed my leg, started dragging me on the floor and stuff. A second angle from a neighbor, according to NBC's local station, shows Kamora on the ground wrestling the man. I was screaming like, get off of me and like, what are you doing? Not going down without a fight, her screaming and kicking, alerting a neighbor. The video shows the suspect running off while Kamora rushes home, immediately telling her mother. My daughter ran in the room and said, Mommy, someone tried to kidnap me. Kamora's mother, Lois, in shock. It was devastating and nerve-wracking, everything. But by the time she went outside to look for him, she says he was gone. Everything inside of me stirred like turn upside down. The Lauder Hill police still haven't arrested anyone. Now more than a month later, telling us they have no updates on the case. Anyone with information is urged to contact them and a $5,000 reward is being offered. Since that afternoon, Kamora travels home from school in fear. Nervous and scared that like he might do this to somebody else. Lois now meets Kamora at the bus stop every afternoon, refusing to let her walk home alone. If you see something that's off, say something. A call for action as the search continues and a community remains on high alert. Maya Eaglin, NBC News. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, take a look at this video. Smoke pouring out of an oil refinery in Oklahoma. The refinery says some petroleum products caught fire, but still not clear what caused the fire. It has been contained and nobody's been hurt. Number two, the Biden administration probably will not move forward on its proposed menthol cigarettes ban before the president leaves office in January. It's probably because of the Congressional Review Act, which allows lawmakers to examine and possibly reverse any rules that the president okays in his last 60 days in office. This is according to our NBC reporting. The Surgeon General today said a ban would help lower the death rate from smoking, especially for black Americans. Number three, a cup of hot chocolate a day keeps the doctor away, perhaps? Hopefully. I hope. This new study found that drinking hot cocoa could protect you from some of the negative effects of fattier foods, especially when you're stressed out. I, I don't know anybody who's stressed, though. Just in time for the holidays, too. Number four, Jaguar, the British car maker, is unveiling this futuristic new ad today, notably missing from the rebrand. Are you looking at this? Where are the cars? OK, but they, they do sell cars. You can imagine there's like a whole bunch of mixed reaction online in response to some ex-users being like, why does this have any car? Jaguar said, well, this is a declaration of intent for the brand and their vision for the brand. So 
There you go. Number five, Macy's giving our friends at the Today Show a sneak peek at some of the floats for this year's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Look at those. There's going to be more floats this year than ever before. A pasta-themed float, one from the Bronx Zoo. Look at that, filled with life-size animal statues. You can watch it all right here on NBC News next Thursday, Thanksgiving morning. When we come back, new warnings tonight from Russia. What we're learning about the country's new nuclear doctrine. Plus, why people are burning bags of hay in France. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Brazil, police arresting five people in connection with an alleged plot to kill the then president-elect and his vice president back in 2022, just days before they took office. One of the suspects was a member of the former president's government. Remember, Jair Bolsonaro lost the election that year. So far, he's made no public comment on the coup plot allegations. Out of New Zealand, tens of thousands of people, look at this rallying in the country's capital today, marching against a bill that would reshape an old treaty between its indigenous population and the British. The bill itself is not popular, and it is not likely to actually become law. Many are also using this moment to celebrate a resurging indigenous language and identity across the country. And out of France, angry farmers are demonstrating against an EU trade deal with South American countries that they think will lead to unfair competition. That is why they are burning bags of hay in one city. They are even pouring out liquid manure. The Farmers Union says protests are planned to run into next month. We're watching a couple of major developments ratcheting up tensions in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. First, Vladimir Putin is putting out a new nuclear doctrine, lowering the threshold for when his country may use its nuclear arsenal. Second, you have Ukraine carrying out its first strike inside Russia using missiles, long-range missiles supplied by the U.S., according to what two American officials are confirming to NBC News. The Russian Defense Ministry claims their military shot down five out of the six missiles. Let's get right to Keir Simmons. How much is this development on the nuclear doctrine that Putin laid out a uh, sort of flexing of military muscle versus a real possibility? We don't know. That, that's the problem, really, uh, Hallie. Listen, there was a moment back in 2022, in October, we now know, from uh, Western leaders who were you know, involved in the conversations where the West thought that Russia might be close to firing a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine. And we only found out about it months, years later. So we don't know how dangerous this is. I have asked officials that. One said to me, I asked one out of one to not to ten. He said about a 6.5. Now, look, Russia has threatened uh, nuclear weapons since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, since its invasion, its illegal invasion of Ukraine, and it hasn't happened. And certainly a, a European official, senior diplomat, tells me that China has put pressure on Russia not to use nuclear weapons. So uh, they've changed the doctrine. The crucial thing that's got people worried is it says that Russia can use a, a nuclear weapon against a non-nuclear state that's allied with a nuclear state, clearly a message to Ukraine and the U.S., but maybe it's a message. Uh, maybe that's maybe it's rhetoric. That's what the British Prime Minister is suggesting yeah. tonight. Uh, we also talked about that other development out of Ukraine. It felt like only a matter of time, of course, before Ukraine would use those long range missiles supplied by the U.S. to strike inside Russia once yeah. President Biden and the administration gave them the green light to do so. What else could the Biden administration do here between now and January 19th, let's say, uh, that could that could help Ukraine in its fight against Russia? Well, not much. I mean, I'll say there is one Ukrainian politician who is talking about wanting Western troops. And President Macron of France has suggested that at one point. But there's no way that the Biden administration would approve anything like that. So uh, this is the last ditch thing, really, isn't it? I, yeah. Listen, I think a lot of this is really about actually about President elect Trump, about mm. the fact that he has said he will demand a deal that he's told uh, the American electorate that he will get peace in in Ukraine. So what's happening, and it happens so often when militaries can see that there may be a ceasefire, there's an escalation. So you've got those tens of thousands of Russian troops and potentially, and also North Korean troops, uh, ready for an offensive to try and push the Ukrainians out of that Kursk area uh, of Russia. And you've got the American administration now saying that Ukraine can use these long-range weapons. It's 
about trying to counter that offensive, but also about trying to send its own tough message. You send a tough message before you negotiate. I mean, that's that's the principle. Keir Simmons, uh, live for us on all of those developments tonight. Keir, thank you very much. The crackdown of political dissent in Hong Kong just went a step further today with the government sentencing 45 activists, pro-democracy demonstrators, lawmakers, politicians to prison. The longest punishment, 10 years behind bars. You may remember back in 2019, widespread, kind of chaotic pro-democracy protests that really rocked Hong Kong. That led to China passing a sweeping crackdown on free speech the next year, the so-called national security law, which prompted dissidents to hold unofficial primaries. They were trying to fight the new law. Well, it's those unofficial primaries now landing them in prison. This is what Hong Kong's security secretary said today. We believe that this sentencing reflects the severity of the crime and also demonstrates that crimes endangering national security must be strictly punished. Clearly not everyone agrees with that position. I want to bring in NBC's Janice Mackey Freire, who's been following every step of the story. Uh, where do we begin, Janice? Is it with the leader of this group who got the longest sentence? Is it with the 44 others here? Uh, take your pick, because there's a lot of developments tonight. Hallie, all but two of 47 were given jail sentences. The toughest 10 years for Benny Tai. He's a former law professor that prosecutors saw as the ringleader of this effort to hold a primary vote ahead of the city's election, the election that traditionally involves candidates that have been handpicked by Beijing. Now, authorities painted him as this dangerous force who wanted to overthrow the city's political system. But for critics and families of those sentenced today, they see this trial as the end of rule of law in Hong Kong. Uh, one of the oldest being sent to jail is a well-known pro-democracy activist known as Long Hair. This is what his wife had to say today. You can say that uh, it's, a, it's a good news that we, there's no more harsh uh, uh, imprisonment. But I want to emphasize one thing very clear, that it is unfair try and it's an unreasonable try. Long hair will be in his 70s by the time he's released, Hallie. How about another name associated with this movement? Probably the, one of the biggest um, when you talk about pro-democracy activism in Hong Kong, and that's Jimmy Lai. He's in court tomorrow? Yeah, he is a publisher who had a newspaper called Apple Daily. Jimmy Lai was arrested in 2020. He's been in solitary confinement. Tomorrow will be the first time he takes the stand in his defense. This is a trial that was supposed to last 80 days, and it's dragged on with breaks for at least a year. Jimmy Lai's health has been deteriorating, according to his son and rights groups. And there are international calls from the U.N. down to rights campaigners who are wanting to have him released. But he's facing very serious charges of collusion with foreign forces and subversion, again, under this national security law that was imposed in 2020. Is this the end of the, the push for democracy in Hong Kong? What does the movement look like after today? Well, the law was Beijing's response to the protests in Hong Kong in 2019. And the government here said it was necessary to stop what it saw as challenges to China's sovereignty. It's now created this environment where there's a crackdown on media and even certain slogans on a T-shirt can be considered a crime. And digital surveillance has been stepped up. When I last spoke with Joshua Wong, who's one of the more prominent faces of the pro-democracy movement, he said, we're never going to give up and we're never going to stop fighting. But then there were the arrests and now this mass trial and a lot of people believing that if it is not killed the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, it has certainly pushed it into the shadows uh, to a point where the U.S. has stepped forward to condemn it and to say that this is uh, another step toward tarnishing Hong Kong's international reputation. Hallie. Janice Mackey for our live for us there in Beijing. We're so glad to have you there, Janice. Thank you very much for breaking it down for us, and I appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, what Texas is doing to try to get more Bibles into schools and how parents are reacting. That's next. Texas has taken another step today, closer to bringing the Bible into public schools. In a preliminary vote today, you had the State Board of Education backing a new optional curriculum that would incorporate themes and lessons from the Bible into classes taught to students at public schools as young as five years old, the students at least. The vote was close. It was not unanimous. It was eight to seven. And it wasn't partisan either. Three Republicans joined four Democrats in voting against. Here's some of the, the comments 
from the public. Our schools are to educate, not to indoctrinate. This curriculum veers towards indoctrination. Our children need instructional material that contain the Old and the New Testament, like the Bible, where it says, train the child in the way of the Lord, and when it grows up, it will not turn from it. A final vote should come later this week. I want to bring in NBC's Yasmin Vasugin, who's been looking into this for us. And Yas, you actually talked with some parents here who laid out how they feel about it. Yeah, I, I think the vote number, Hal, that you brought up is actually pretty important to kind of start this conversation because, as you mentioned, right, three Republicans siding with um, Democrats there arriving on that eight to seven vote. And the passage of this first vote, by the way, the second one will be um, later this week to finalize where they land on this decision, including this um, curriculum in Texas public school systems. But if you're someone who supports um, this measure, essentially the argument that's being made is that the Bible is part of American history and integral to public school students learning about the Bible and subsequently Christianity as well. Um, and that also it promotes literacy. But, but I did speak to some parents who are very much against this measure. And while they are not against necessarily talking about and teaching religion in schools, they want it to be equal opportunity, right? If you're going to learn about Christianity, then you should learn about Islam. You should learn about um, Judaism and all the other religions as well. And if you're going to learn about the good in these religions, you also need to learn about the bad. Here's some of what Lainey had to say. She's a mom in North Texas of four kids. I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. I'm unsurprised. Uh, but I'm also really worried. Our concern is a singular narrow ideology being forced upon our children. Uh, and we really believe these important conversations don't belong in curriculum. So final vote, Hal, is Thursday. And if, in fact, um, it passes, which we expect it to do, uh, this curriculum will be instituted in these public schools in September of 2025. And they're saying, by the way, it is voluntary. However, there are financial rewards to the public schools that decide to integrate this curriculum into their schools. It feels pretty, uh, you know, all but certain that there will be legal challenges yeah. if this does end up passing here. I have to think that uh, sort of given the process, there's a chance that it may end up at the Supreme Court. Yeah, I mean, that's what everybody's saying. The folks that are supporting this measure feel pretty confident it'll get through the Supreme Court as well. And they're looking back to a, dis to a decision two years ago in which I'm sure many folks remember it was a coach who essentially they decided in favor of him being able to prey on the field, not separating essentially church and state in that measure. And so folks saying that this is going to go all the way to the Supreme Court, those that are against this measure are worried about that. Those that are for it think um, it's going to live even in the Supreme Court. Yasmin Vasugian, thank you for being all over this one for us uh, and have. watching it, as I know you will, in the days to come since we expect that decision. Thanks. Coming up here on the show, what the world's biggest store is saying about how much stuff we are all buying ahead of the holidays. That's next. So we're getting an early, very early read on holiday spending. And it looks like, at least at America's biggest store, people are buying more stuff. Walmart says sales are up, reporting in their latest earnings that people are spending more on stuff like toys and stuff for your house. That's even as prices are still going up for some essentials like groceries. That doesn't seem to be stopping folks. Brian Chung is joining us to break it all down. This is so interesting, Brian, because this tracks with somebody that you and I have talked about. I've talked about with our colleague, Christine Romans. While people will, on the one hand, say they don't feel good about the economy, they feel like things are expensive, watch what they do, right? And that's their, they're spending money still, right? Yeah, well, and people might say that the overall economy nationally doesn't look good, but their finances look okay, and it's underscored by the spending that we've seen so far. But what is interesting is that people might be cutting corners in the other holidays this year so they can spend for the big holidays at the end of this year. That's underscored by the National Retail Federation coming out with some really interesting statistics showing they project an increase in the spending for this particular holiday season from $875 billion. These are billion dollars of figures uh, in 2023 to 903 billion dollars in 2024 but look at all the other holidays back to school halloween mother's day other expected big spending weekends yeah well you're seeing those figures actually lower on a year over year mm -hmm. basis so again people are just maybe cutting corners in some holidays so that they can really uh you know blow the bag for uh, for the holidays at the end of the year what about this idea that folks are hearing a lot about right now of like doom spending 
Yeah, well, look, doom spending, the idea there is that because of everything that's going on in the world, it, it applied most uh, m most to the pandemic, right, when people were stuck inside and they wanted to get back out there and go to the mall and splurge a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, that is still certainly happening when you look at just certainly what we've gone through in 2024. We had the election. Uh, we've had drought here in the Northeast. I mean, you know, a lot of things that people are just, all right, you know what, let's try to get my mind off of this and go to the mall, right? But also in impacting this is the shorter holiday season. We have to remember that actually Cyber Monday they will fall on December. It will be December 1st. So that gives you less time between uh, Black Friday and Christmas this year. And then the deal hunting mentality with inflation still out there. So people might be looking at all these things in tandem and going, you know what? I'm going to make this holiday season a big one. You got to have something underneath the tree. So yes, despite everything else in the world, it might <laughs> seem like doom, but at least I can open up my wallet and give myself a little retail therapy. So dang, Brian, like I felt like I already had enough stress in my life. And now I'm like, I haven't even started holiday. Neither shop. have I. Like, What's on your list? What's the bit? What's like the hot I, thing for you I and need, for people generally? I need new contacts, as you can see. This is a new feature. This is a new feature. So I gotta, I gotta look at my FSA. I wasn't FSA gonna mention my... the specs. It's a new look for you. And yeah, I'm, no, I, I, I need, think, I need yeah. a new supply of contacts. New proof. <laughs> All right. All right, friend, we'll send you um, some HJN contacts for the holidays. Thank you so much, <laughs> Brian Chung. Appreciate you as always. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.